Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with author, psychologist, and dear friend, John O'Neill. He's been the president of the California School of Professional Psychology. He's been a leadership coach. He's written books like The Very Profound Paradox of Success, Leadership at Keto, and Seasons of Grace, which is a wonderful book about gratitude that he wrote with the head of Alan Jones, the head of the Grace Cathedral. John, I'm reaching out to you today. Thank you for joining me. But I can feel within my bones an urgency. This is a great time of disorientation, a great time of despair, a time of transformation, and you've had these beautiful conferences, and most importantly, a long time ago, after I got off the airplane, from the, going from Kennedy Airport to Beijing, and I hadn't taken anything to read, I ran to the bookshop and I got this book called The Paradox of Success, and I read it, and when I got to the World Economic Forum, you were running a panel, and I became a client, and you helped me sort myself out in one of the most disoriented, confusing times of my life. So in a disoriented, confusing time for society, I couldn't imagine bringing a greater gift to my audience than, by, than inviting you to explore with me here tonight. So thanks for, thanks for being a part of this. Well, you're welcome. I'm delighted. I'm just delighted. Well, John, you, you are also, I'm going to go right to the heart of the matter at the outset. You've recently written a book that hasn't been released yet it's called Life, the Whole Enchilada, and you've created a wonderful nudge in your profile of me where you said I was too media shy. And if you said to me, <laughs> who's my co-author and found in this podcast, there is no question that it was when I read that paragraph in Gulf, I said, I better get on my horse, John, John's beckoning me. <laughs> but John, where, where we are right now? <clears throat> Lots of social unsustainability, lots of despondent politics, lots of fear of climate change, and then this pandemic comes down like an alien on the planet Earth. And I, I want to hope that it's a gift because it was disorienting an unsustainable system. But it's too daunting to be that cheerful at the outset. How, how are you seeing what's happening? You've worked with powerful people as a life coach. Many, many people who are in the, what you might call the pantheon of American awareness and heroes. What are you seeing and what are you, what are you recommending and teaching people in this uh, dreadful experience? Well, thanks, Rob. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, let me go quickly through the setup so I, I kind of understand where, where you want to go and make sure I'm going in the right direction. Uh, let's start with with where we are. Uh, let's identify it properly because we so often don't, and that's understandable since we live in the present and we're now experiencing the future that we've never seen and we don't understand. There are three parts to the future, as I see it, that are hitting us sort of almost all at once. The first part is uh, we had a very flawed economic system that has kind of held us up in a curious way. It's floated us, if you will. You can imagine humanity floating on a sea of economic nonsense. <clears throat> so that's number one. That's been going on for some time, and you and others have been trying to call attention to that. The second thing is this thing called climate change, which is very slow. It makes, uh, it makes market crashes look almost uh, speedy, as it were. But when you have something as grand and as horrible as we have been treating the earth, our, 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 our tribe, if you will, has been deliberately trying to destroy the earth as best they can without knowing that, that that's what they're, they're doing. Uh, by just gouging it, taking a piece here, a piece there, letting this go by the way, uh, whatever pleases us. In fact, there's a very interesting group of Israelis who wrote a book called Sapiens. And oh, yeah. I, I've been 
deep into that and 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 into the heads of those guys, and they've got they've got a full understanding, I think, of how serious this is, how deliberate it is, and how hard it is to turn around. It's not easy at all. And then the third thing is the consequences of of climate change may be reinforcing the pandemic. So if it didn't reinforce this one, it will the next one because climate deeply affects how we interact with each other. And as you know, this is not the first, not the last pandemic. We'll have more. And climate change, in in addition to all the other things it's doing uh, to affect our lives, is uh, deeply, deeply affecting in the case of something like a pandemic, a new disease. So there is all the good news right up front. That's where we are. Let's, yeah. don't, let's don't blow it. Let's don't put any kind of machine on it. What let's do is to try to understand how we got here. And when Europe was in, in deep trouble back in the 20s and the 30s, really deep trouble, uh, and it suddenly erupted in the form of Nazi Germany, we were surprised, but if you did just a little bit of work, you could see where all the shadows were uh, all over Europe, dark, dark shadows. Uh, I'm reading another Churchill book I've written. Though. I mean, he's, a lot have been written about him. They're all pretty good. And this one is very good. And Churchill saw these shadows, and he was almost panicky about it. He had a kind of sensitivity to it. He saw the dark thing that was happening, and so did Jung, Carl Jung, and so did Freud. And they were the ones who gave it the name Shadow. And what it is, it's all the repressed anger and fear that we walk around with every day suddenly comes to the surface. And we see really frightening, horrible things happening. And that's what happened in Nazi Germany. You can read that in great detail. So we know that. And we know that we have shadows all over the place. Our society right now is probably filled with shadows that we have never really believed we would have. We have shadows of of the most horrible kind of bigotry that's just coming oozing out of it. It's almost like it's, it's part of the plant that we call the earth. It's just oozing out. We have shadows around hate and and frankly, and injustice that have gone on for years and years, they're now coming to the surface. And as we squeeze everyday life for people, uh, more and more of these shadows will start to surface. Now, some of them could wake us up, which would be nice. That would be lovely. But most of them, unfortunately, right now, are just leading us in the wrong direction. Mm Mm-hmm. In fact, I think what they're doing is really leading us as a humanity into the direction of some kind of game, zero-sum game in which if I sit in here in the U.S. and you sit just south of the border of the U.S., you're less significant than I am, you're less worthwhile in terms of what I should do for you, in short, we become provincial, we become really ugly in our hatred, and we've got to turn all that around. All that shadow has to be released. And if I didn't learn anything else <laughs> from Jung, it's that if you don't get things out of the shadow in your own personal life, in your society, they're going to come back and they're really going to haunt you. And that's where we are. Yeah, and when you talk about climate change in your three-part context of where we are, ugliness, hatred, provincial, it takes my mind right to the United States and China who must collaborate on climate change, pandemics, and many other issues for this planet to survive. Yeah. And we're going in the wrong direction at high velocity right now in terms Absolutely. of that cooperative and collaborative spirit. So when did now, that start in your mind, Rob? When did we start to turn that corner? 
Oh, in the U.S.-China relationship, I, I'm quite attentive, as you know. I, even when I, I was flying from Beijing to Davos when I first met you. That's right. Uh, That's I, right. I, was, uh, uh, I ran the Soros Quantum Emerging Growth in the non-Japan Asia portfolio uh, in those days, and I, I've stayed very devoted to, to them and that region and, and its implications for the world ever since. And uh, what I would say is, John, there's a kind of rough and tumble political economy. And you see America, multinational enterprise in particular, going over foreign direct investment, technology diffusing into China, taking advantage of low environmental restrictions, low labor costs, and exporting back to the United States. What we saw in that context was very, very disruptive influence, particularly in the manufacturing sector in the United States. But what we saw was when the currency, the Chinese renminbi, was misaligned when it was undervalued with the dollar, a whole bunch of powerful interests in the United States, Nike, Walmart, people who benefited from foreign direct investment, tried to stop the United States government from complaining and demanding adjustment. Wall Street wanted access to the financial market of China as it modernized and integrated with the rest of the world. So there were, and there was what I'll call the Pepsi dream. Pepsi or Coca-Cola can sell 1.2 billion consumers, huge scale. And all of those dreams carry us from the 1990s, maybe even a little earlier, in the era of Deng Xiaoping, through the WTO, but, and this is before Donald Trump. The Chinese started to have to improve their environmental conditions. The Chinese started to have to raise the compensation of their workforce as they were moving towards the middle income status. And many people were migrating to the coastline. The Chinese had a lot of woundedness from the opium war, had a lot of woundedness from the Japanese invasion during the war, the Second World War. And the dignity of that nation, which was once called the Middle Kingdom, was harmed, was wounded, and they sought to regain their stature. Around 2015, and this is really to answer your point, the Chinese did not choose to integrate their financial market. They compartmentalized their market, maintained and intensified capital controls. Right. American technology firms were finding, instead of the magic, what I call the Coca-Cola dream, the Chinese were learning the technology and then replicating the firm right next door. And the state management would facilitate growth of market share by the domestic firm, not by the joint venture. Right. The rising labor standards and the rising wages compressed the profits of the traditional Chinese uh, foreign direct investments owned by the West. And I would say, uh, finally, the Chinese announced a program called China 2025, which discussed displacing knowledge-intensive systems or sectors of production with Chinese domestic firms, including things like the Silicon Valley, the Amazons and Googles and so forth, being held out in domestic alternatives. So the Americans said, in a model of comparative advantage, they didn't meld with our system. They didn't converge with our system. They didn't allow us market share and benefits. And even in 2014 and 15, places as multilateral as the Council on Foreign Relations were writing 
angry, hostile, national state strategy, anti-Chinese reports. Yeah. Add to that that the workforce that had been displaced in manufacturing watched a deregulation, tax cuts for the wealthy, and a gutting of their infrastructure and school systems and no adjustment systems. And that's, the, that's not the Chinese fault. That's the response of the American plutocratic governments. So you had two wings. The powerful felt like they had to develop a tougher stance vis-a-vis China, and the people who'd been displaced were bitter and despairing. Yeah, And Donald Trump brought those signals together. But those reports and those episodes that I described here in a long-winded way were all available on January 10th <coughs> excuse me, of 2015. And he didn't get elected until November of 2016. Right, right. The and other... the, Chinese, the Chinese will say to you, we never intended to converge and become free market capitalism. We have a different social system and a social philosophy and we're we that was your illusion not ours yeah well the other little factor that i remember uh, i think you told me was japan japan had really come up in fact if you remember a wonderful book my friend tony ethos wrote called uh Japanese, the, the, the Japanese uh, system, or the Japanese method. And what it said was really they, they understood how to do manufacturing, that Japan really had conquered that, and they were going to take over manufacturing. And the Chinese took that very seriously. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so what they did was they began to steal all of Toby's work <laughs> because they thought he had the right, the right idea. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then when the when the uh, paradox came out and it, it took off in in, uh, in Japan, which surprised them, and South Korea started to buy a lot of copies. China decided to publish it themselves, and so they didn't bother telling us about it. They just went ahead and published it, and then distributed it to to the first year class of every college student in in China. Wow. And why? Why did they do that? Because they saw what happened to Japan was that as soon as they got successful, really successful, they started to blow it. And uh, they, mm-hmm. they really gave away their, their advantage. And we remember that very well. So China's been playing the long game and the short game. We always yeah. want to give them one game or the other. Well, you, you, you're right. Cause around the time I met you, 1995, I think we met, but 94, the Chinese did a massive devaluation. And before right. that, the Japanese were doing their outward foreign direct investment right. in Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and it reoriented. The Asia crisis of the late 1990s, 97, yeah. 98, was the byproduct of the 94 devaluation. Yep. which just reoriented all production towards China and away yep. from the ASEAN uh, constellation. So, and, and so the Japanese were outsourcing and faltering at home, and then China accelerated that and drew the energy to their platform, their country. Yeah, exactly, exactly. They also revamped their educational system, which we don't need to, to go into here, but they were playing many, many, many sides to this game. And frankly, they just saw that we were just getting behind, that we were getting lazy. We were getting very self-satisfied. We were bragging about how good we were. Always a bad thing. And uh, and they saw that, and, and Japan and China both took advantage of it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, Rob, are you engaging these days much in, in giving the pandemic – what comes next, and and then what is it that uh, we need to be doing, people like us, what do we need to be doing to help out yes. in the effort? Uh, very much at the center of our inquiry. I mean, I, John, I start with uh, the Institute for New Economic Thinking in right. the realm of ideas. The yep. dysfunction that you described 
the failure of the economy, the challenge of climate, the pandemic, is an unmasking. Okay. No one can stand up at this juncture. Right. Even when people are afraid and, and want to cling to the familiar of the past, they cannot stand up and, and tell you the orthodox economic model will deliver you from evil. Right. Because right, every, right. it's like Rome's burning here. And, yeah, uh, exactly. And we can't be fiddling. So it is uh, in the intellectual realm, the question of what do people trust, believe in, what yeah. I will call the, the collapse in the integrity and trust in expertise, which has got a lot of negative consequences. But yeah. the, the question of the resurrection of expertise is a part of INET's view. But, uh, but, John, what's interesting to me is these are not disembodied mechanical exercises. These are emotional textured exercise and you have worked with leaders leaders probably uh, are susceptible to thinking that their formula that brought them to power and strength might be good for all time that's right they become systemic conservatives they become defending of what Ernest Becker would call their uh, their legacy or their immortal identity that precisely just beyond their bodily life right what how do you break leadership out of those crutches and put them on the path of truly leading, evolving the dynamic, and being truly great, which deserves a legacy? Uh, that, how, how you, you live in tutoring people, including myself, but much higher level people. How do you help that process? Well, recently, Rob, I've been doing two things, and they both seem to be working, and I don't want to say enough to brag about them, but one of them is you should. You to should. insist I won't work with any company now unless they give me 10 questions that are vexing them that they must answer in the next five years. Ten questions, and they're big ones. I mean, they can't just be trivial. They have to be really serious. And... Uh, one of them is a very large transportation company that everybody knows the name of. Uh, and uh, they're now working on the sixth. I, that was two years ago when I, I did that presentation. They're now working on their sixth big crack through that will keep them afloat. Transportation is really up for grabs. They know it. They're very smart people. And so that's the first thing I do is insist that they claim their problems. In other words, it's another, to translate that into Jungian speak, it's insist that they look at the shadows. What's brought them here? What makes them great? What do they brag about in all their ads? Well, that's where your shadows are. Let's get on with it. The second thing is that I, for, I insist that they form teams and that those teams be extremely well balanced, even if they have to go outside the company well-balanced in every possibility so that they don't have a bunch of feet people from the staff sitting on these committees. They can have a, a, a feet to one, but that's it. And so uh, the same company had teams of 10 there, and they cut those back to eight because it's a global company, and they were having a hard time sustaining that. But that's what's solving the problem is what is it that we, as a team, can understand and get our arms around and solve. Mm -hmm. And that's going to make the difference in our business and to our customers. And the whole exercise starts with a deep understanding of what their customers are going through, especially if they don't know their customers very well. And in this case, this company is in so many different business lines that they know just a little bit about their customers, but not a lot. So that's that's what that's today's exercise. It's it doesn't sound very exciting or glamorous, but it's it's quite effective. Well, at some level, it's not wasting your time. Exactly. Unless they're prepared, <laughs> right. they can't they can't impart and be, and benefit. You can't impart to them and them benefit from your insights and wisdom. So so why bother when there's right. all kinds of yearning out there for you to serve? So I think, well, I it's, think, it's interesting how, how quickly uh, big global companies say, yeah, you're right. I mean, they, they absolutely uh, see it, and uh, they just never have known quite what to do about it, or it's come to them in different pieces. 
and never as a global problem. Mm. Mm. And how about individual leaders? How do you, uh, what I would call, help them evolve into a constructive and less fearful or defensive posture? Well, that takes that takes much more time, unfortunately. Uh, so the first thing is they have to spend their first year when we're together digging into their shadows. Where are they? What are they? How do they get there? How are they going to get rid of them? And that's a, that really turns out to be the most exciting part of the exercise. They love it. Mm-hmm. The second thing is they have to go back into their businesses or their investments and take another look and see if those are lined up with their soul. If you don't have investments that are lined up with your soul, you and your team are destined to create real trouble in the world for yourself mm-hmm. and everybody else. Mm-hmm. And the third thing I think that, that happens over and over with individuals, Rob, is that they, the, the shadows keep growing, the ego keeps getting bigger and juicier, and they just simply have to go through a number of exercises to get that back in, 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 in some kind of shape. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, especially if they had a serious damage like you did where they had a big overnight success and uh, the, there was no time for anybody to be prepared for it. So then you had to go back and dig out and say, okay, what happened here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what did yeah. I run into? <laughs> what was so good that turned yeah. out to be so mean? <laughs> yeah. I remember, I remember those uh, days when I was disoriented and shuddering and yeah, <laughs> that people wouldn't let me watch soccer games to my children because they all wanted to do business deals or trying to cotton up to a sales partner. <laughs> right. I, exactly. felt, I, felt, I felt more lonely when I was being pursued like that than I ever have since or before. Oh, yeah. Oh, and I, yeah. I, I, that, as you know, I clung to my buddies from Detroit to get grounded because I knew yep. that there was love between us that existed before that crazy fanfare. And I, yeah. I, I remember a, a reading that you sent me. There's a Indian guru, Sri Ramana, uh, Ramana Maharshi, 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 excuse me. Maharshi, uh, Maharshi. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And there was a woman who was a disciple. Her name was Lucy Cornelson. Oh she my God! You remember that? Book, <laughs> yeah, called Hunting the Eye. And wow. I remember sitting down with this thing because there was all this kind of artificial aggrandizement in it. And, and I was dissatisfied. I was not in a place that I thought was resonant with where I wanted to be. I kept saying to me, this has got to be a chapter, not the whole book. But when I read Lucy Cornelson's Hunting the Eye, and Hunting the Eye was the title paraphrase, which said essentially, when you're unhappy, you start to dig in. And when you finally dig in, the thing you're hunting it's your own ego. And until right. you break through that, you're not on a path towards what they would call enlightenment or, or a deeper sense of purpose. Right. And and hunt, I kept felt like I'm hunting myself. I used to look in the mirror and say that. You were, you were like, how would I say, my uh, advisor in the field to kill this animal. <laughs> That's but, it. That's it. You've got to find it. you got to find it. But... Uh, but I think, John, you know, the my intuition here is that for us collectively and individually to make progress, it is precisely at the times that people are most disoriented and anxious that they can become most defensive. Yep. Right. And uh, I remember reading, uh, there's a wonderful philosopher named Stephen Toulman. He wrote a book about the... Uh, what is it called? The Hidden History of Modernity. It's called Cosmopolis. And in the book, he said, you could see after the Thirty Years' War how everybody was afraid and they went into this abstract place that we now call the Cartesian Enlightenment. All right. And the humanism of Shakespeare and the humanism of, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember the famous French humanist. Uh, starts with an M. Montaigne. Montaigne. Montaigne, oh Montaigne, yeah. yeah. And and these people were almost extinguished in terms right. of the mindset. And then you applied the technocratic <laughs> disciplines, the mechanical disciplines that worked well in the natural sciences, the social science. And what Toulmin says, 
And then the fault lines just became so big and so vivid. But every time you had a social breakdown, people got so scared, they lurched back to the familiar, not forward yeah. to the evolution. And the, and the case study in this book was the civil rights movement, the 1960s, the Eastern philosophy, the enlightenment of different ways of seeing. And the anti-war movement obviously fueled some of that. And then everybody lurched back into what I'll call the years of Reagan right. and the nostalgia. And, and he wrote the book about all of these episodes, but the culminating chapters were those. And so I, I guess it's a long-winded way of asking you a question. What do we do now? What do we do now so that we don't sit in the fetal position, drink too much, huddle around our past successes? How do, we, how do we help people leap forward and embrace this very complex and disorienting failure of many of our systems and put Humpty Dumpty back together again? Right. Okay. Well, first of all, we have to completely revise and update and clean up the, the education system. We are not educating people. We haven't for a long time. We are at best, we're at best training them and training them to be techn technocrats. Yeah. And, and we're afraid of true education. We're afraid because true education, as we all know, is based on questions. Ask the great mystics, ask the, the great philosophers, questions, questions, questions. And we become terrified of questions. And I wasn't going to use Trump, but I have to. One of the worst and saddest tragedies that we're witnessing here is his inadequate capacity to frame a good question. Mm -hmm. Questions terrify poor Donald because poor Donald doesn't know how to even attack one sensibly and honestly. He throws some kind of uh, TV made up language at the question and then walks away and pretends that it didn't happen. And so we're, we're stuck for this little tiny period right now that we're in yep. until we get on the other side of this and begin to uh, really ask questions. So I'm going to give you a, a hint about what I'm going to tell Joe Biden when he calls. All right. So Biden's going to call and he's going to say, what can I do at this stage because the world is coming apart and they don't want to hear his political speech? And I'm going to say, yes, don't do that. <laughs> no political speeches. No pious babble. But what you can do is begin to get people acquainted with the big questions that have to be raised. Where are we going? How are we going to get there? Who's going to take us there? What are the big barriers that we face? How can we use our generosity and warmth and, and love in our favor as opposed to turning that into some kind of acidic process that, that destroys everything we see? And I'm going to ask him to appoint his new cabinet. I'm following Doris Kearns Goodwin's great book and say, okay, starting tomorrow, these are the people I'm going to have around me and I'm promising them a job in, in, in the cabinet. Uh, we'll, we'll sort out what that, the exact details of how that's going to work. But in the meantime, I've asked them all to address the biggest three questions that they know of in their realm. Mm -hmm. So if they're in HEW, what are the three, is, three biggest questions there and so forth. Wherever their center of expertise is. And we've seen what this nice, Italian frail doctor has done with the pandemic. He's gradually taken over the leadership of that, whatever there is, because he's honest and he's decent and he asks good questions and he doesn't pretend like he knows everything. Yeah. So if Joe had a cabinet like that, that just mm -hmm. kind of, just honestly, just <laughs> filled the room with that kind of energy, that kind of a remarkably ex exciting adventure, 
we'd all want to go. We'd all want to jump on. Mm-hmm. So that's what Joe's going to hear from me when he calls, and I hope. Okay. He, what he was more? What was Lawrence Goodwin's book? You said uh, was that Democratic Promise? Team Arrivals. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, Lincoln's cabinet. Oh, right, right. And, and you, you remember, Rob? He he promised those people their cabinet positions when they were still in Chicago at the convention. That's right. That's so right. So he that way he let out to the party bosses. We're going to be in good hands. We're not going to have any really horrible people. On the other hand, he, he reassured a lot of people that they were going to have a, a real job to do, and they weren't coming just to to uh, fill up seats. Yes, yes. Well, I, uh, I'm, I'm very interested. I know, John, you've been involved in the relationship between technology and broadening the dissemination and access to education. There you go. And the other dimension that I, I'm also powerfully impacted by is one of the future guests on this podcast and man who's been a fellow at uh, INET, uh, Michael Sandel. He's writing oh, a book yeah. right now. Sure, I remember him. We, we did a video course for students together, a six-hour course called What Money Can't Buy, Morals and Markets. Oh, my, and, he, he is so good. Mm. And he's got a new book now that's in process coming out uh, probably in the fall called The Tyranny of Meritocracy. And uh, I know other, William uh, Dariswich at Yale has one called Excellent Sheep, The Miseducation right. of the American Elite. Yeah. And, and what interests me here is that when you watch Trump get elected, I'm, I'm really going, looping back to his incapacity to be supple and empathetic and, and confident in the intellectual realm, actually met with some applause because a whole lot of people felt like elite degrees were not a symbol of someone who had earnestly gone deep and broad and had gifts of lateral pattern recognition and could synthesize, say, from a position of leadership and governance for the common good. They right. viewed these people as getting a certificate to membership in an elite club that was a marketing agency for plutocracy and corporate power. <laughs> and right. so the excellent sheep were becoming what you might call in the knowledge intensive inputs to production and legitimation. And they weren't dealing with the big questions because the big questions are often paradoxical. They yep. involve dilemmas. They have a sense of poetic provocation. They're unsettling to yep. people who are self-satisfied with their existing power. Precisely. And I, I really have been interested in your passion through your Good Life series, which I've attended and enjoyed greatly, and through our conversations about how not only do you want to reform the dissemination of education, but the content of what yeah. is in that education. And the things right. you had us reading were old Shakespearean plays and philosophical tracts and biographies of fascinating people like Churchill. How do, how do we not only use technology to create broader access, but reset? What is the priority of content to create a more soulful society and leadership within that society? Well, we probably need right away something like, well, what David Brooks asked for this morning was trivial compared to what we really need. We need a WPA for the mind and the soul. We need big, big projects, rescuing kids, rescuing people who are on the streets and so forth not just rescue them to feed them and put them in some kind of housing. What we need is to rescue them as people before they get there if we can and then help them find their way out on their own. Mm -hmm. And that requires a huge, huge undertaking. It's the WPA of the mind and the soul, and we need that now. We need it right today. And if we just change people a little bit, or if we just give them enough hot food and housing to keep going while we 
create another one of these problems, um, we haven't done a damn thing. So right. we need to get on with real, real examination at the roots of our society. Why are we here? What are we doing? Why do we need so damn many of us? We don't. Uh, and uh, how are we going to deal with climate change? Those questions alone would bring us to our knees if we truly address them. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. I see a lot of people, which you might call working to disseminate those STEM disciplines to the uh, emerging countries and poor regions within the advanced countries and so forth. And that's not a bad thing. No. But I think the deepening of that curriculum, of yeah. the sense, defining the sense of collective and individual purpose from a deeper place, that's is it. also a missing ingredient. Huge ingredient. And that, by the way, is the job of tomorrow's leader that we need, the one we need, right there. Yes. Yeah. That's the job. And we have lost so, we were so far away from that, it's just it's just almost scary how far away. And yet, I'm not pessimistic. I think we can do it. I think we can do it. If I can watch some, some uh, huckster from New York have as much power and wield it and make, create so much damage, what would it be like if we found someone who was really good and she started to ask these questions and get us to ask them? Yes. So we, we, we've proven we can destroy. Now let's prove we can build. And uh, I know, Harold, I said, I can't remember what you describe people at in your new book. You, you're the whole enchilada. Life, the whole enchilada, I recall, was the right, working right. title. But exactly. you had people who were like shapers. And then shapers? you had people, uh, they were like shapers of the, the future, or I can't remember what how you described it, but there were sort of certain people that were like embodiment of wisdom. Right, right, that that's right. Emphasized, and then there were other people who were like examples, and it was just fascinating for me to see, you know, the, how you wove the, the Nelson Mandela's and others into this vision, and, and it was done beautifully in the because I, I can I can feel your professional experience. The different stages of life yeah. require yeah. different uh how do you say different transitions and different types of wisdom and different types of teaching. I I always remembered uh I can't remember who was it that said uh her name was Pearson and uh she said the hardest transition for a man is to go from being the warrior to being the wizard. Right, right, that's she, right. It, 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 you're done with your accomplishments, and now you're trying to impart goodness that's good. and, like and elevation for other people. And yeah. uh, she was sort of a Joseph Campbell uh, style of writer, and uh, I'll have to dig that up. I remember James Hollis writing a lot about these issues as well. That's but right. He, he passages in the me, middle of life, and particularly he focused uh, in some of his writings. What was the one on uh, Under Saturn's Shadow? That's it. Uh, you gave. I remember that was a book that you turned me on to as so, well. But, uh, but I, I think let, I, you talk also about in the mature years. We have people who are very powerful and elderly and – Books like, what well, was uh, Helen Luke's book, Old Age? Yeah, right. Her chapter, The Winnowing Fan, about That's the it. kind of fantasy beyond Homer's Odyssey. That uh, it, there was a passage in Homer's Odyssey which talked about what you had to do to evolve to the next stage. It was left there, and she wrote the story of what should have been what you might call the story that fulfilled that curiosity. That's correct. And uh, But I, I'm just curious, what it, for people 55 and over, other than the paradox of success, Aikido leadership, 
what, where, where do you take those people so that they don't feel powerless or helpless or put out to pasture in this new technological age? How do you, what's your call to action to them? Well, I think, thank you. I, I, my feeling is that you, you named most of the people for whom we should express our eternal gratitude. Okay, you name most of them. Our teachers, right? Our mentors. The people who we, I call wisdom carriers. People who brought a little bit of wisdom to a young guy in Detroit just at the right moment. And uh, it took him in a whole direction that he never knew existed. And then these lovely people called character shapers. And uh, I, I love that name because it really means that they came along and in their own way shaped our characters. And we may or may never, we may never have actually thanked them for it. <laughs> we never, so now's our time to thank them. Now's our time to show our gratitude. Because without them, without a John Gardner in my case, my mm -hmm. life would have been very, very different. Without a Nelson Mandela who came into my life, it would have been very different for me. And so forth. Each one brought something. And the proximity didn't matter as much as our readiness to listen. That's what mattered. Mm -hmm. So when, whenever you meet someone like that, the, my, for me, I think it was Eleanor Roosevelt when I was just a kid. Uh, it just changed somehow how I thought about the world because the questions Eleanor Roosevelt asked me raised me 10 feet off the floor because she really was honoring me with those questions. And I felt like, hey, I can go do things. I can go, I can go do a lot. So th those are the people, Rob, that I think we need a lot more of and we need to recognize them. And the funny thing is you don't need to pay them huge salaries. They really like doing what they do and wouldn't do anything else. Yeah. But they, in, in essence, they're not working for money. They're working for mission. That's exactly right. And they love learning themselves. So it just makes their lives so happy to help teach a grateful student. Well, it does you and me. I mean, we're very grateful. Occasionally when we get a student who comes along and says, you know, I want to know something and Boy, it feels so good. Yeah, yeah, it does. And uh, so, John, uh, I I think you ought to be in Joe Biden's cabinet. <laughs> if, if this was the circus, if this was the circus, you should be the ringmaster. <laughs> if, if you had, if you had a, if you had a way of being the person that could filter out who belongs. And who doesn't in that role of leadership? With all yeah. the teaching, I remember Joel Henderson was a big teacher of yours. Uh, big teacher, yeah. All the people that you've shared with me, all the ways that I've come to understand my own challenges. If you were sitting at Joe Biden's side, and or whoever is the president's side, but I think you'll be talking to him. If you if you were sitting there with him. You can recognize the character, the sense of purpose, and and help people refine and evolve that. And I think I think it could it could transpire. You, you could bring it off. I mean, I remember reading George Leonard's book, Mastery. That's your right. initiative. That's right. And uh, Gifts from the Sea, which was an easy one because I was a sailor. Sailor, and uh, there were just so many different poems and things that that jogged me. I kind of like, I feel like I want to raise money so if Joe Biden's elected, he can use half the money for his election campaign fund. The other half is to support your office in his White House. <laughs> 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 Well, I would I would be honored to help set something like that up. That would be great fun. So if you run into an opportunity to do it, let's let's do it together, okay? All right. As you said in your uh, reference to me in your latest book, 
that uh, we need, as Dylan Thomas said, to all go bravely into the dark night. <laughs> That's right. I know you're the guy with the flashlight. So uh, <laughs> I want to I want to thank you for being with me today and exploring. And I I want to reserve the right in a few months' time to call you back. It might be the day after election day. To see how I can well, impart huh? what you've taught me and help you impart to this next administration these necessary ingredients so that we can evolve. That would be lovely. Thank you so much. This has been great fun, my friend. Yeah. You never know where you're going to pop up in Davos one day and the next day I'm in Sausalito. Thank you so much. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Take we'll, care. Uh, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.